This happens all the time. You're driving in your car listening to the radio when you hear about some terrifying feat that's befallen one of your fellow men, and you find that you have no emotional reaction to it whatsoever. The newswoman can be describing just about anything, so long as it's not too close to your own backyard and doesn't raise your taxes, anything at all, like bombs ripping apart the brown bodies of men, women, and children on some vaguely understood continent, like a vicious rape in some city you've never been to, like the systematic murder of an entire race of people in a country whose name will soon escape you, any tragedy at all that exemplifies what monsters we all really are, and you find that the most shocking thing of all the only thing you react to as you sip your second cup of coffee on the way to the local supermarket is that you're wholly unaffected on any level. You panic, not because of the terrors the radio voice is painting onto your gray matter, but because you realize that something's changed. Something in you has died. You attempt to prop yourself up. You try to convince yourself that you do care, that you're deeply moved and outraged. You even say out loud to the no one riding with you in the car, Jesus, that's fucking terrible. Just terrible and awful in order to prove to yourself that you're a responsible, empathetic citizen. But alas, wearing a tin crown won't make you a king. You're an imposter, a hollow-eyed imposter, whose soul is covered with three or four thick layers of ugly callus and scarce tissue. A shame that you've expended more emotional energy on yourself, on trying to feel something, than actually feeling it. Okay, wait, maybe this doesn't happen to you. It happens to me. I admit it, all the time. And maybe I just said it was you because it's difficult for me to accept. Too uncomfortable to look squarely in the eye, and I'm trying to disconnect myself from it. The same way I try to disconnect from anything painful and real and uncomfortable. How could this have happened? I contribute a fair share every time this very radio station has a pledge drive. And for the explicit reason that they can continue to tell me these tales of horror, in a way that's not driven by corporate bottom line sensationalism. Oh no, I don't go in for trash media gossip, tabloid frenzy celebrity sensationalism because I, of all people, a supposedly self-aware, critically thinking member of society, fully understand that that sort of sensationalistic media consumption just leads to, well, Jesus, oh Christ, at least to desensitization and emotional detachment. This is the major theme underpinning the 1992 film Man Bites Dog, a Belgian mockumentary chronicling the making of a documentary about a gregarious serial killer named Benoit. The film, made by Remy Belvaux, André Bonzel, and Benoit Polvord, who also star in the film as the documentary's filmmakers and serial killer respectively, uses an absurdist take on media desensitization as its given pretext, employing the archetypal serial killer's emotional apathy as an analog for our own media-induced zombification. The documentarians follow around their killer in the same manner as another documentary might follow around a birdwatcher or a salesman. Ben, in fact, discusses the finer points of his murderous occupation in much the same way those others might discuss the birds they watch or the sales they close. He talks about weighing down a body so it sinks, for instance, in a way that's purely a matter of physics and, as a result, blackly hilarious. In fact, despite this making its appearance on our annual Halloween special episode here, this is first and foremost a comedy. In similar gestures of humor of the darkest sort, for instance, Ben inspects the schlong of one of his black victims as a matter of curiosity, and he kills an elderly woman by heart attack inducing scream as a way to vary his method, to keep things fresh, he says. He kills so many and so often, in fact, he simply forgets about a taxi driver he's murdered and bristles at the menial tasks of his profession, such as dumping bodies into the river. In a clever allegorical indictment of the media as an integral part of exploitation, the filmmakers, who are dispassionate observers at first, soon become participants and accomplices to the killer's crimes. First they decline the killer's invitation to dinner, but in the next scene they're drinking wine and eating seafood with him, and in fact agree to have him fund their project. Before long, they're helping to get rid of the bodies, aiding in the act of murder, and the climactic scene, even worse than that, raping a woman as if they were frolicking across a summer lawn. If the film can be faulted for hitting those same one or two notes of social criticism over and over again, its merits far outweigh its shortcomings, and it's a lot of fun to watch from start to finish. Most striking, perhaps, is the performance of Poulvord as the killer. He plays the part with an endearing jocularity so at odds with his gruesome actions that it's a constant source of tension and fascination. Reminiscent of the clownish colorings of Roberto Benigni, he's irresistibly watchable, joyously infectious, and at least on the surface, his performance is what holds this film together. The brain-smacking sort of juxtaposition of Ben's amiability with his savagery carries through to the constructions of the film as well. 
And I think it's here in the filmmaker's instinct for effective juxtaposition where the genius of the film lies. Time and time again, a seemingly innocuous happening or bit of dialogue is abutted with a scene of wipe that grin off your face brutality. There are many instances of this, but I'm thinking specifically of the sequence where Ben plays with pop gun wielding children in the street that cuts directly to a montage of cold blooded gun slangs. It's one of the most jarring things I've ever seen on film. Man Bites Dog was more or less a student film and went on to win special awards at Cannes, proving indeed that, as the fellow says, necessity is the mother of invention. In order to endow their work with value in the absence of funding, celebrity, and effects, the filmmakers mined for something that a big picture studio system not only wouldn't provide, but couldn't, that is, brazen originality. For brazen originality is too risky an investment. As a result, they made something like a found footage film that predated the frenzy by more years than seems possible. Now the term man bites dog is a journalistic aphorism referring to news media sensationalism and the disproportionate coverage of the freak occurrence. As in, if a dog bites a man, no one cares. But if a man bites a dog, well, hell, that's big headlines, let's cash in. It's the simple mechanics of attention-grabbing exploitation, the grievous supply and demand dynamics that makes commodity of cold-blooded killers. But the funny thing is, the term dates back to something like the late 1800s, way before anyone even dreamed of a television, let alone our endless river of social media diarrhea. So this parasitic relationship we have with our streams of information is nothing new. It was a thing back when we received our news by, what, pony or carrier pigeon once or twice a month? And it was the thing when Rodney King was beaten in the streets of Los Angeles the year that this film was being made. And you could bet your precious iPhone sweet ass that it's still a thing today. In a time where we can erase an act of violent imperialism from our consciousnesses with nothing more than an inch of thumb swiping across a tiny screen. We live in a day where our constant connection to media-borne information has bred the disease of capital D detachment. The same sort of capital D detachment that we associate with the serial killer's absence of empathy just like Ben's in the film. And let's be clear about this, lest we're under any illusions. Just as the killer and the filmmakers of the documentary film are active participants in his exploitation, so are we, the viewers. We, the viewers whose unquenchable bloodthirst has ultimately reduced the news to vaudevillian bits of comic tragedy to digest and shit out, or simply scroll past, or to express feigned outrage about on our Facebook pages. In the cold light of mass media history, Man Bites Dog has proven itself to be more than just a criticism of late 20th century media inundation. It's a prophecy of perpetual fucking doom. It's the end of the world as we know it. But hell, isn't that always the case? All right, thanks a lot, Joe Mummy. How does it feel to be <laughs> Joe Mummy again, first of all? Ah, very good. Yeah? <laughs> yes, feel like I got, I got my bandages back on. <laughs> I'm all dusty. It's uh, wonderful. The fact that you used to run around as Joe Mummy is... is... <laughs> I'm ready to talk about horror and killing hour after hour for years and years. To well, come. here's the thing. Now we get an opportunity to once a year have like a horror-themed show. But what you brought up in your uh, little introduction there, which was excellent, by the way, uh, is that this is essentially a comedy. And this is this is how I viewed this movie, Joe. That it, this is nothing more than a comedy. And I guess what we can talk about maybe is that what the filmmakers do here is that they take all these horrifying acts and they somehow make you laugh at it. And it's mostly because of what you said. Uh, his name is uh, Ben. ben I, hate, I hate pronouncing these names. I know. Ben, ben Wap. <laughs> ben Wap. I was going. Polvord. <laughs> Pol yeah. Polvord. Pol uh, who's absolutely phenomenal. Let me say this, man. This is one of the best performances I've ever seen. I'm dead serious when I say this. This, it's great, this man. man is absolutely captivating from beginning to end. He carries the weight of this film on his shoulders. Anyone else could have come in here and tried to do what this man did. What he did was completely unique, completely captivating. 
He's moving in a million. He's his, it, It's like you're watching him, Joe, and his brain is moving at a million miles per hour. He's really quick on his feet. And you know what? This movie benefits from it being outside. You know, it took it took its limitations and turned them into um, assets. You know, it didn't have actors or money or, you know, big money. So it turned it. They wrote us. They wrote a part for this guy who's their friend and obviously the filmmaker. And it just fucking, they just found magic, you know? They found that lightning in a bottle that you guys were talking about a couple weeks ago on that. Uh, And it's fucking amazing. And just, you know, yes, he does, on the surface, I agree with you, carry this film. But also is the second thing that I talked about, I think, which is in the actual filmmaking and in the juxtaposition of um, these scenes, they, they do a really brilliant job and it's, it all, it can almost go unnoticed. You know, it's just, it's amazing. Their editing is, is pretty, pretty fantastic. Well, Dave, uh, how do you feel about man bites dog? Is this your first viewing? I got a feeling you had to have seen this movie before. Yeah, it's definitely not the first time uh, I've, I've been through this movie. It's uh, my second time, by the way. And yeah. I, I mean, I really enjoyed it the first time, but this time, I mean, I was, I mean, I couldn't help but, but just, I was constantly laughing, constantly. Cat captivated yeah. and laughing, constantly. It, it, it's hysterical, and, and it's hysterical and grotesque, right? It's, 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 it's all of that at the same time. And, and, and I think that's what's, well, that's what I find uh, amazing about it anyway. It's just that it, I don't know. It 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 manages to to freak you out and then make you laugh and then freak you out and then make you laugh and 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 you I don't know, you get wrapped up in it. Yeah. Uh, it's it's like on par with like what Kubrick does with with like a Clockwork Orange in a sense where you know you're you're watching, you know, this villainous a horrifying man, you know, go through life and perform these these acts that are just you know, just god awful, and yet you find yourself like kind of like laughing at 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 this man, and you know it, it's somewhat similar here. You know, with 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 what with what they're doing with Ben is what Kubrick was doing with Alex, or at least that that tone is somewhat similar, which is really fascinating and really really hard to do. I mean, you're talking about this guy going through. I mean, I, I don't even want to you know say it because it's really not funny. But you're you're laughing at what this dude is doing, Dave. Well, yeah, because it's so it's just so extreme, and and you know Joe's very right to mention the the juxtaposition, right, and and showing the the <laughs> you know the the parallels of hey, let's tell a funny story about you know Bridget Bardot's panties, or let's play you know guns in the street with these kids, and then all of a sudden it's like <laughs> you know brutal violence, murder being thrown yeah. in your face, right, and you're like holy shit, like it, it's really and it's like really jarring. And you've seen you've seen gunslangs on film before, right? But when it's when it's preceded immediately by this dude playing with these kids in the street, or the same whatever followed the Bridget Bardot's anecdote, you know, it's just so much more powerful because of the way that it's it's constructed, you know, the way that it's placed inside. Yeah, the film. It, it's a real condemnation, right? As a film, like I see a lot of a, a lot of what Hanukkah has done later on in this film, right? And in, in, in the sense that yeah. it's a it's a condemnation of, of violence, but also a condemnation of the audience that seeks the violence and and yeah. and, and the whole culture of violence. You know, it's, yeah. it's a condemnation of the thing as a whole, which is really interesting. It's great that you mentioned Hanukkah because I did watch this film during the period of time where I ran through Haneke's com- like complete library of films and on Netflix, they used to be better at it, but you know, at that time, you know, they recommended this movie to me. And at the time I was watching a lot of, you know, European films, uh, you know, Ga- Gaspar no and, and this film and Haneke and so on and so forth. And uh, you're right, Dave. I mean, there's definitely, you know, I mean, Haneke is definitely tuned into to something like this in his later works. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, you, you see it in particularly in Funny Games. Absolutely. Or, or, oh, well, like, of course. Yeah. Benny's video. Benny's um, video and Funny Games particularly. Yes. Absolutely. I cache to some extent, too. There's the voyeuristic elements. Right. Much like Man Bites Dog. You know, it's got a docu- documentary kind of style. And mm-hmm. cache has that real like voyeuristic lingering right. camera thing that it does. It, uh, it, it, it I, I'm sure that there was some influence going on there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Max, Man Bites Dog, you bring it to the table. You've listened to what we have to say. You want to jump in, my friend? Well, I have to uh, say that you're all saying amazing, appropriate things about this film. But, Tom, you said 
nothing more than a comedy, and I completely disagree with you. I mean, I was not laughing at the end of the Christmas party after the gang rape of the fat girl, and then it's the morning after, and she's completely gutted. Yeah, but I'm so her... yeah, I'm so numb to all that stuff because you know I've seen well, that kind well, of shit before in A Clockwork Orange. It's just it, no, it's... you didn't see that in A Clockwork Orange, Tom. Well, you didn't I didn't see, see a rape. Woman's guts hanging out. Well, you didn't. Can yeah, I, that's can that's. Yes. Can I finish my sentence? Sure. You didn't see a woman's guts hanging out. You didn't see her open, steamy entrails on the table and and God knows what fabric stuffed in her mouth. You didn't see a bunch of, you know, naked dudes. I mean, the film crew, they yeah, become but killers too. I might, he, I, Kubrick might not put that in a Clark or Orange, but in your imagination, those thoughts are there, my friend. Oh, no, no. I, I, I totally get the Clockwork Orange thing, but but this is not... You said, quote, it's nothing more than a comedy. And I was not laughing at that point. I was deeply disturbed, and, and it's, it's, it's perfect, because everything you guys were saying was why I chose serial killer culture to kick off this Halloween run. And, and it seemed like in that show, none of you understood what I was talking about, and in this show, you all understand it perfectly. Right. So I'm very confused, frankly. Well, it's not you talking about it. It's the film, right? <laughs> the film was talking about. We were talking about the film. Right? You're not talking about Yeah, but he's the setting film. up a theme. I think that... <clears throat> yeah. Does. Well, as a, well, just to, to, to go to that point with that, like, that, gruesome, that terribly gruesome scene in the aftermath of that, um, you know, that rollicking rape or whatever... Uh, you know, again, I, th <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, well, they're, they're, they're like bellowing, oh. they're drunkenly bellowing cinema. I love while that. They're, <laughs> they're, but, but I mean, I think that that part, that setup is to make, is to, uh, you know, make, make the joke more effective in, in, by contrast, you know, <laughs> like, like the joke and the, and the, the uncomfortable, the dark humor of it. Is just thrown into further relief because of how gruesome that 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 stuff is, you know. Right. Well, listen. Here's the point, fellas. This Benoit is one of the greatest cinematic characters in the history of all things. I agree. First of all, I love how he calls out people on their bad breath, on their acne. <laughs> I love how he is pristine. He's a teacher. He's a scolder. And at the same time, he can put on a priest outfit during Christmas and get really, really drunk and create the most amazing alcoholic beverage I have ever seen. The, the dead boy, uh, <laughs> the string scene is absolutely outrageous. Then you've got on top of all of that, fellas, let's really look at this. You, you mentioned it, Joe. This, this. Maybe Cannibal Holocaust before that. Maybe a couple other obscure titles. This, in 1993, was the first found footage horror film, I think. Because, again, it goes into what I'm talking about where, yeah, it's funny and you're laughing and you're like, oh, my God, why am I laughing at this guy? But you're having a good time at Benoit's birthday party when he gets out of the uh, hospital and he's got the neck brace. And then all of a sudden you are not laughing. And you are plummeted in despair and awkwardness. I was laughing, actually. Yeah, I was, I was too, Joe. I'm I was laughing. <laughs> it's actually funny. It's that really. Well, dark, it's a neck brace, uh, Joe. Laughing. It's obvious. That's humor. Like you can't, you know, you can't go any other way on the screen. If you put a character in a neck brace, right? It's it's immediately hysterical. <laughs> well, even I mean, just there's this really twisted humor. In that silence after he shoots that fucking laughing guy, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like as to, yeah, it's but just... doesn't Jenny break your heart a little bit that she's still trying to appease him and calls him sir, and she's his old friend and she gives him a stuffed yeah. gull and That's... she has blood splattered across her face. It's yeah. tragic. It's the, it's the fun. It's that it's the um. It's the greatest kind of humor to me. <laughs> like that is the fun. That's the funniest fucking thing. I mean, it's like the best. The best humor to me is, d depending on your mood, it could look like a fucking tr uh, tragedy, and at the and in another day it could be something completely hilarious. Right. <laughs> I swear to God, no, you know I, what I, I mean. See you there on the mood thing. <laughs> yeah, like I, I think it's just the way the light that you're seeing it in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? And I, I even as as terrible as that is. I still think it's funny. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, I know that's odd to say, but right. How about that scene guys? How about that scene? Just the social, the sociopath trying to make connections 
where Benoit is trying so hard to get the guys to go out two hours away from where they are. For some muscles. Have a muscles dinner. <laughs> yes. And the muscles dinner turns out to be a fucking nightmare of, of vomity proportions. <laughs> you know, there's vomit, there's, there's anger, there's all kinds of things that explode. But in his fucking derailed brain, here's a chance to bond with the boys. And he does. I mean, he gets very close with Remy. You know, and it's so I, weird how you're you're so on edge wondering who Benoit is going to kill next. But in his particular uh, psychological, uh, physiological makeup or whatever, this dude is choosing who he's not going to kill, which I thought was fascinating. Right. And this is where, again, I want to get into the brain of a serial killer and, and those horrors, you know, because they can be so charming and so funny. We haven't seen a guy like this in movies. We well, never, yeah, we you never know, do. I, I agree. I uh, agree with you. You know, Max, we talked about this uh, a little bit a long time ago when you first came on the cutting room. We were talking about Ted Bundy, and I, the director uh, Matthew Bright, who did Ted Bundy, kind of made uh, a lot of the scenes laughable. What Ted Bundy was doing, and you kind of like, you know, you kind. I remember you got on me saying. There's nothing funny about it. It's, you know, <laughs> it's Bundy. You know, if it was, you go, if it was. This Ted. was much funnier than that movie. <laughs> uh, you know what the problem but, was with that movie is that there, were, there was actually something real there that there was actually victims and they're like making a, this mockery of this guy who actually killed these fucking people. Right. I but think that was the issue. That okay. But had. even if that's the case, it's still, I mean, Listen, it's how can I say this? Look, you're still watching a movie about a serial killer, and you're you're laughing at the acts that this guy does on screen, Joe. Right. Okay. I, so I understand, yeah. but it's still it's still interesting to me because my point about the Ted Bundy film was that I thought that the director believed that Bundy found himself to be funny during these the, the, mm -hmm. during these torturous and heinous acts. He, you know, and that's what he was trying to convey to the audience. And I think that that's what they're they're doing here. Obviously, with a fictional character, it obviously works a little bit better here, probably because of what what Max's point was. Yeah. I think Max said it was a great. I remember this to this day. He goes, "Yeah, it's funny if the movie was called Ted Crazy." <laughs> <laughs> But it's not. <laughs> it's true because you do have to put it into you do have to put it into uh, context. You Absolutely. know, you got it in a in a sense. You Absolutely. Know? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm with you on that. This, uh, but Max, you know, I, I do apologize if I said this is nothing more than a comedy. Bad choice of words. Obviously, there's a lot more going on here than this just being a you know an, an ordinary comedy. But I I think what I'm what what I was trying to to convey was that to me this movie is. You know, it is a comedy. I think it's more comedic than any any other genre name you want to throw on this movie. Okay, I, and I I totally hear you, but this is kind of again I'm trying to bring it back to the the exploitive desensitization of what's really happening here because I've seen this film multiple times. I own it. I have the Criterion version, by the way, which if any version you have to get, it's that one because they always do good treatments on on great films. But but Tom, I mean, I, I sat there. Laughing and then and then the next minute I was I had a lump in my throat and the next minute I mean my God when when Benoit uh, for people who haven't seen the film you know don't listen but when when he winds up actually killing a child it is one of the few times and there are a few times where you see his humanity where he's like fuck I, I didn't want to do that but I I had to and then he gets all analytical and starts to dissect you know like Joe said the physics of dropping the body in the moat or what, you know, right. whatever, right. you know, I mean, you, you see like in those urgent moments, he had to do what he had to do for him. But that death of that child, for me, it just brought me back to like Henry days, you know, when we would talk about, you know, that's another movie I brought to the cutting room was Henry mm -hmm. portrait of a serial killer. Last Halloween. Yeah. Is a great companion piece to this film. And, uh, you know, oddest tool at one point gets his hands on a video camera and sure enough, they're filming the death. You know, and, and it's just like, how do you do that? Can we talk for a second about Remy and his character and how he started out and what his arc was to this thing? Well, Joe, Joe, uh, you know, mentioned in his introduction how the crew uh, at, at some point begin to participate in, in what what Ben is up to. And Joe, right. I mean, that 
Probably at that that seafood yeah. dinner is where where that arc starts to happen, right? Yeah, just like Max was just saying, they they don't want to go out to dinner with them, and then they 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 eventually are going to dinner with them and being fun. Their their movies being funded by a killer. I honestly this. Just take the 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 title of the movie is taken right from uh, you know news newspaper lingo and even um, the subtitle. What is it? It happened in your neighborhood. That's such a it's such a news thing. Like this could happen in your neighborhood. I, right. I this movie is such a uh, it's such an indictment of the me you know media and exploitation. Like so, it was difficult for me. This is like the third time I've seen it. So I I just really analyze it from a, from that perspective on this. So seeing Remy as anything, you know, I'm I'm seeing all of them as, you know, sort of uh, analogs for, you know, Remy as the news media and, you know, the killer as the story. I, I see Remy's character basically as the media and how the media is enabling uh, in incre- incrementally enabling the killing to happen. You know what I mean? So like the media is funding these these people to go and kill people in a, in a sense. And turning you know them I mean? into killers. Turning the media into and killers. Turning, and, and so by proxy, the media is, the media is just as part of the, the bloodletting as, as the killer in a sense. And you know, because And then you, you see their fate because they got yeah. too embedded. Too embedded. Yeah, it, yeah. And, it's, and, it's, and it's part of... Um, uh, uh, I, geez, I just, lost my, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry, Tom. Oh my God, Joe. What's going on over there? <laughs> Oh. Dad brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's talk about these these ISIS videos for a minute because I think they we can there we go. can very easily That's... tie that sort of thing into to this discussion, and and I think it's, I mean, this is ultimately kind of what we're talking about, right? Uh, are should we watch these videos should we not watch these videos yeah that's do we yeah well do, you, you, you know is it <laughs> is it a, 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 a are we obligated uh journalistically to to show these videos there's a lot of people who won't and who refuse to and sites that have said they won't post links and they will you know youtube takes down uh any postings of these videos or anything like that uh there's a lot of people who say that it's you shouldn't watch them it's unpatriotic to watch them uh but on the other hand uh why do you is, have is why reality? would they why would they reality? listen there's no like to me there's no doubt that the only reason why a news network would would play any of those videos as opposed to just simply reporting well an unfortunate you know person had you know was beheaded they could just verbally convey that to the public we would all get it you know why they would show that dave there's only one answer for that it's sensationalism it's you know it's it's to get people to watch because See, it's what I we're think, talking about here that this is what fascinates people this is what people but I, want I think there's two answers to that actually and the problem is is that the, the the problem is is you don't have one without the other right so uh why why does the media need to show this because there's a there's a difference between uh you know uh isis beheaded a guy today uh and the actual reality of seeing a, a fucking guy get his head cut off uh y- you know by some maniac with a big knife you know like like there's a there's a difference between the the language used to describe that and 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 seeing it directly and and i think particularly in the case of, of, of ISIS or, or any of these sorts of things, if we're going to be making decisions that, that are, are probably going to involve, uh, you know, dropping bombs on people and, and, and putting people in harm's way, um, I, I think it behooves us to, to pay attention to the reality, right? And, and to, to see, okay, you know what, if, if we're doing this because, you know what, this beheading stuff is, is just not on, well, let's see what that really looks like. What what is it really? Let's experience it. Let's not turn our eyes away from it. Let's not be oh no, we can't we can't look at that. Oh. I, I think we need to look at it. I think we need to really look at it. You know what's crazy, Dave, is that what's so ominous to me, after years and years of these of these maniacs producing these videos or whatever, these are sincerely produced videos. And what what has been happening lately in the campaign for ISIS with these videos is that they're well produced. You can see that they're expensive. Uh, and what happens is they don't actually show the beheadings. They only show supposedly the aftermath. And now you've got people saying, is that Photoshopped? 
is this guy really dead? This, there's so much confusion, which I think is even more terrifying, is that they are trying to produce videos. This group is producing videos that can be showed on major news outlets because you don't see the actual uh, yeah. cutting or beheading or whatever. And, and, and to me, to me, that's even more uh, catastrophic and ominous and, and, and truly frightening. Oh, for sure. Like, like, what, I, what are they shooting for? What are they shooting for? They have, they have, uh, they have cinematic values. I mean, there's, there's graphics and music, and yeah. it's like a Hollywood production. Uh-huh. Do you know that ISIS actually produced like a, a Hollywood quality film? I, I, I'm glad I forgot the title of it, but it's like they're using like movies to. to Do you think they did Avid or Premiere? Exactly. I mean, it's like, wow, these guys actually, do they have a green screen? You know, and you watch these idiots. And, and again, I got to pull myself away. But you, you see these idiots debating. Well, you don't see wind on the victim's orange jumpsuit in the desert. There would be <laughs> wind in the desert. And that gets you thinking, like, what, what am I being sold here? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, because look, there, this is the and this is this is the the other difficult part of this, right? Is that on one hand, I absolutely believe that a good use of media is to show us reality and have us engage reality and what's really happening. Um, but part of the problem is of that is that you can exploit that instinct. You can exploit that need to to show a reality, right? You, you can manipulate that. And some people have gotten extraordinarily good at it. And, and, and you, you know, there's a whole business based around it. You know, it's called public relations. So. so Max, there's a possibility that ISIS might just be making man bites dog, you know, for, you know. That's <laughs> right, Tom. That's yeah. right. And scaring the shit out of us with bullshit. Yeah. Wow. Joe, have you seen any of these videos? I have not. And I don't want to, I, I don't watch them. I don't watch them either. I, it, I don't. I'm not yeah, one, I don't. Yeah. I, I understand it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult discussion because I on the one hand I, I see both points. You know what I mean? That's I see kind of why I brought these movies up for Halloween. <clears throat> you know what Halloween's yeah. about? It's about repelling evil. That's why we wear wear masks. That's why we put jack o' lanterns out on the porch that are lit. It's to repel bad things. Well, <laughs> most people think it's a celebration, Max. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know. Joe, you seem a little disturbed. It's just, I don't know the answers to this, you know, and it is disturbing to me. And I, I don't, I don't watch them on, you know, purpose because I, I don't like, I don't like the environment that the media is creating. Like, I don't, I don't think that it's right that they're selling commercials based on, you know, tune in in 10 minutes. We're going to show you somebody getting beheaded. I don't think that's right. Like, I think that's morally it's not right. That's horrifying. Wrong. Yeah, I, I think it's horrifying. I don't know if they're going to that extreme, though. I mean, really? Are of they course saying, they well, in 10 well, minutes, dude, here listen. comes a beheading? <clears throat> well, here's the problem, man. I mean, in America... Even the news you know, outlets I'm, are scared of these guys. Well, in the news, in the news is paid for by commercials. You know, they, they exist to sell commercials. So they're going to say... I mean, it's obvious that they sell... They're going to show you the most sensationalistic thing... You know, and of course, everyone's going to tune in because it's almost like but you can't Joe, stop it because it's part of human like nature. Most people like you are so, like you. They don't want to see this stuff, Joe. They don't want to see that, it. But I know. I get so you. So you don't know. have to see it, Joe. You don't You don't see it because you won't watch it on the regular news. They won't show it on the regular news. They'll just yeah, show a the, frame for it. So you'll never yeah. see it anyway. Yeah. I, I, I just personally be really interested in seeing how many people are actually in favor of of war, uh, particularly war in the Middle East, uh, after being – if they were shown the right images by the media. Well, yeah, because now they just – You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you're saying, Dave, because the last time we went to war, we just said, well, you know, the man has, you know, these, these nu- nuclear weapons, and we got away with that. Now people want a little more more proof here. You know of what what people are doing and what people have and what what they're capable of. So these videos, no matter who's making them, and I'm not like saying you know it's a any kind of a conspiracy thing here. That's exactly what the government and the media want right now to exploit uh, another war. Well, okay. Here's a here's another que- here's another facet of it, right? Because 
There was a uh, in the in the previous um, documentary that we we talked about serial killer culture. They were discussing um, a law that had been passed about barring ser- uh, violent criminals to profit off of their crimes, right? And so it was basically something to um, you know limit exploitation. Do you think that if news outlets just across the board refused to show this stuff, that less and less of this type of violence would occur? On would they would the they be less apt to make a production out of beheading somebody? Would they behead somebody? Would it matter if no one's watching? If a head falls in the forest, <laughs> ah! <laughs> nice, Dave. Uh, yeah, Joe, they don't you know, I, these videos. Well, someone's showing. Someone said, "I uh, are they not showing them? I don't know." No, Joe, you know, they're writing about them and describing them, but they're yeah. not showing. Yeah, see, them. and that's it. I get my I get most of my news from the radio and from newspapers. Still, well, that's I guess, why so. I go to Best Score and kill myself because it feels yeah. like it's a more realistic view. I get, uh, yeah, I get most of my news from Bill Maher. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, listen to you over there with the goat. No, listen, this is obviously this this conversation is going to roll over uh, into the next segment because it's it's all uh, it's all the same. Let's get things moving along. Let me introduce 15 murders. Let's continue this great conversation. We're also going to be bringing in uh, Hart Fisher from the uh, Heart Attack podcast and uh, www.americanhorrors.com. He's coming up too. Uh, let me do my introduction and we'll keep uh, we'll keep it rolling. <laughs> 